morning, everybody. It's Wendy, and I'm in the office of cable television, film, music, and entertainment. Welcome to the Sanctuary Radio Show. I have a great guest here, and what we are doing right now is taking a second to go to our Facebook pages so that we can share the video, and then we will ask you to ask questions, um, make comments, say any you know anything that you want to say to help us to um, make this a fun learning experience, because it's definitely going to be a learning experience for all of us. Um, so just give us a second. We are sharing this to our pages. Uh, let's see. I'm sharing it to my personal page. One second on my timeline. Okay. So like I said, please feel free to ask any questions and anything like that. Straight? Okay. All right. So we have Jessica, the engineer, is going to get ready to count us in. And whenever you're ready. All right, we holding on for a second, but come in. And if you're watching this later, then you'll have all the information to be able to go back and look at the websites and everything's for my guest to be able to connect with him later if you're watching it later. Welcome to the sanctuary. You're listening to DC Radio 96.3 HD4 and dcradio.gov. I'm Wendy Cherry, your host. And today, of course, it's another one of my favorite topics. And we are talking about financial literacy and ways to build wealth for generations to come. So in the studio, in the sanctuary with me today is my friend, Mbwebe and Ishangi. Welcome to the studio. Greetings, what's happening? So I'm gonna read a small little bio and then he'll flesh out the rest. So Mbwebe Ishangi, it teaches personal finance, business and career development skills that encompass much more than the traditional financial education. He focuses on instilling knowledge and confidence so that people can experience um, financial dignity. I love that word, financial dignity, sometimes for the first time in their lives. Um, and this, when they have financial dignity, they are able to live off of their savings and investments. This practice can then lead to the creation of intergenerational wealth and sustainability, which is what we all want. Shout out to my special, Marsha. I see you, Marsha. Welcome to the show. So, Embuebe, let's talk about how we met. So, so you, for those of you who have um, listened to my show for a while, you know that I love to travel and I have been to Kemet. Egypt was what we know as Egypt. It is Kemet. And so we were in Kemet together 2016. 2016. So almost three years ago, we were in Kemet together studying and um, then we just bonded. Yeah. Yeah. And then later we went to Costa Rica together. So I went with you and we can talk a little bit about that. Um, we went to Costa Rica to study like farming and, and fresh foods and sustainability. And we went to like, um, I'd never been to a food forest. Mm -hmm. I never thought about a food forest. Mm -hmm. So it was really an eye-opening experience. And then we um, both were in corporate America around the same time, and we both left corporate America about the same time. <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, our paths are sort of on the same um, way. And then he finally did his African ancestry test and he came up Cameroon. So, hey, Cameroon, that's, you know, y'all know me. If you listen to my show, that's where on my maternal side I traced. So we bonded. And so now we just, he has more information to share. So it would be, uh, it's not even a question of whether he would come in and share with, with my listeners and viewers. So welcome. So let's talk about financial literacy. And I had never even thought about the um, the term of a financial dignity. Mm -hmm. I feel like our people are so scared of money, are scared they're not going to get money. 
don't know what to do with money. And I've never even thought of there's dignity to it because it's energy. Absolutely. Okay. So break down how you even started to think about the term financial dignity and how you got into this. Okay. Well, first I want to, you know, Useko, um, in the whole Fell Day language saying thank you, giving thanks for this opportunity to be on the show with you. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, the journey, you know, it's it's really interesting because when you <clears throat> when you face reality, my reality was I worked for the NBA for 12 years and suddenly I was, you know, I was I was fired from my job. Um, not because of work ethic, but because of my social media page. And in my social media page, I address issues that are pertinent towards the upliftment of Africa, the African diaspora, right. through education and through also implementation of what you've learned. So I was immediately let go mm -hmm. and faced with reality of, okay, now how am I gonna make money? Right. And in doing so, I had went, began this journey unknowingly. The first thing I thought about was, okay, I, I have money in my reserves as far as 401ks concerned. And I started pulling money out of there. But in that conversation with my broker at the time, he started revealing information to me about the, what 401ks are, what recessions are, and that they're planned. And so the money you think that you're putting there may not necessarily be there. Mm -hmm. uh, and it started scaring me because I'm like, okay, wait a minute. you know. And this happened to me before and probably to all of us in the last housing recession of 2007 and 8, um, there was over $1.4 trillion lost in the senior uh, senior, uh, as far as age bracket is concerned, right. these people lost $1.4 trillion, which means their nest egg was completely wiped out. Right. Uh, they might have lost their homes. Uh, they couldn't afford med med medical aid. They couldn't see their doctors. So they were put in positions where now they were too old to get a job right. and to make money, but yet they had no money that they, the money they saved was no longer there. Right. So I started to put myself in that position. Okay, well, you know, at the time of the recession, I was in my 30s this can happen again because it's cyclical. So what yep. do I do when I'm at an age where corporate ageism sets in, where I cannot get hired because I'm just too old or I have too much tenure and, and pedigree? So I realized that, you know, there's something I'm doing wrong. Mm -hmm. I need to rethink this thing and figure out what other people are doing and how are they living off of what my broker told me, living off of your find, um, your savings and investments. That when he hit that to me, that's when the light bulb went on. And said, wow, people actually do that. You can actually yes. do that. Right. So that's what put me on the journey of, of learning about this thing and, you know, tying in the fact that around 2016 is right before the, the craze of cryptocurrency came about. Uh, I got into cryptocurrency mm -hmm. and, you know, turned a $75 investment into eight months later into over nearly $15,000. Oh, wow. So that really got me to thinking, OK, what is this? This is a whole new game. I don't understand what this is. So I started diving into what cryptocurrency is. And, you know, we are probably aware of the fact that cryptocurrency then around 20, well, last year, 2017, 2018, kind of hit a bubble, went down, mm -hmm. the hype went down, everybody caught it was, you know, it was a farce or whatever. Okay. But now we're seeing today the cryptocurrency is, is $12,000. It's, it's just went up in the last few days. Oh, wow. So it, here I have comes some Bitcoin. Again. Yeah. <laughs> here, comes the thing, here comes the drive again. Right. But that isn't the only thing that you can make money at. So that's when I learned between 2017 and 18 of last year that there are other ways that you can make money and create intergenerational wealth. And that's when I really started understanding, okay, what is financial literacy? Right. And that is a topic that is taboo in the African-American community or Powatis, I'll say people of African descent in the United States, because we don't want to talk about money unless you owe me 20 bucks. So that was the problem that I felt needed to be addressed head on because we really are afraid to talk about money, even though we need it. But why do you think we're afraid to talk about money? Uh, because we don't know how to, we haven't used it as a tool. We use okay. it as a, as a form of survival. And okay. when you're trying yeah. to survive, you're trying to get whatever you can, but as soon as you get it, you got to give it out. And you know, there's a reason why we're still 99% uh, consumer, 1% producer. We have that mentality of as soon as you get it, give it out to pay, to cover something opposed to let's get it and build it into something so that I won't have to keep asking for other folks to give it or to, to supply me with my needs. Right. And it's interesting <laughs> because if you listen to the news, they don't even they don't even refer to human beings mm -hmm. as citizens. Absolutely. They can they they refer to us as consumers. Yes. Consumers <laughs> have done this. Consumers have yes. done this. They don't say Consumer the human reports. beings. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. that's interesting. Okay. Well, there's a there's a I wouldn't say two quotes real quickly on um, that really hit me and, and it's really been the the definition of, of what I've been aligning myself with as of late. Okay. Uh, one, it says, if you don't design your own life plan, chances are you'll fall into someone else's plan. Yeah. And guess what they have planned for you? 
not much. <laughs> right. You know, and then Martin Luther King said it all too often when there's a mass unemployment in the black community, it's referred to as a social problem. And when there is a mass unemployment in the white community, it's referred to as depression. Mm -hmm. So there is some economic disparity. When I've learned about financial literacy, there's a reason not, and not that it's just catered towards black people not knowing about it. It's the, the masses, you know, 99% of people don't know what money is and they just hear it's just a tool to get instead of a tool to invest. Right. But we lack the most information about it because we don't, we've been using it as a form of survival as I mentioned instead of how can we build and sustain ourselves. So it's a totally different mindset shift that you have to have when realizing what money is and what it can actually do for you. Because it right. isn't about the, the, the material things. Right. It's really about food, clothing, and shelter. Right. Those are the primary, the primary things. Right. Yeah. So another way to put that last thing you said is like, if you ain't at the table with the information, then you the meal. Facts. Facts. <laughs> that's, that's another way that yeah. I like to life in general. If yeah. I'm not at the table, if I don't have the information, if I don't know, then I'm the meal. Right. So what are, so you said 401k. What are your thoughts on a 401k? <laughs> um, it's a game. The whole thing is a game, number one. Yeah. So it's how you play it. Mm -hmm. You either get played or you're playing it. Yes. And most people are getting played. I was getting played. Uh, and 401k is supposed to be that nest egg, right? Mm -hmm. It's supposed to be there for when, you know, 20, 30 years away. It's your money, mm -hmm. but you can't touch it, or you you can touch it, but you're said not to touch it until you're 59 and a half, right? And then you won't be taxed. But if you touch crazy it crazy penalties, then, yes, you touch it up to five times, you can be taxed, and so that gives you the mindset. Well, I'm not going to touch it. Well, what they don't tell you is that in a recession, it's not guaranteed it'll be there. As I mentioned before, the last recession in the uh, senior citizens uh, bracket, 1.4 trillion dollars was taken away and not replenished. It wasn't put back. I lost $250,000 and I thought, man, that's a lot of money. Da, 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 da. I still don't understand the game. And I thought that this recession was a, you know, once in every time, you know, once in a lifetime type thing. So, right. okay, I just got to re up. Like I got to man up and maybe double Work down, harder. Yeah, double down on my, on my, in my uh, investments. And hopefully this won't happen again. But then when you study the history of recession, understand mm -hmm. that it is planned it's yeah. cyclical it's systemically cyclical um, cyclical and it happens anywhere between 10 to 12 years that another recession happens so it's 2019 right now right and if you look at what's happening in venezuela we're in the same hemisphere mm -hmm. you know what's happening in venezuela could actually happen here and all it is all it takes is you know the market to crash or the hype of the market crash. so give us the high level of what's happening in venezuela because okay. people okay so yeah basically uh you know they their commodities is, is, is basically at stake. There's really nothing there for them to invest in. And the government actually has been tapping in to run the government. They've been tapping into citizens' checking accounts to run the government. Oh my God. And so, you know, but at the same time, Venezuela is also breaking off and trying to create their own cryptocurrency because they have as a commodity, um, they have oil. Okay. Um, so there's, what I've learned about recessions is that, you know, there's a balance. So if the Western hemisphere is, is, is hitting chaos, the other side is, is, is experiencing an, an increase. So okay. this thing happens in teeter totters and balance in a cyclical form consistently. So we're kind of due any day now, and that's not like Debbie Downer or whatever, but we are due to have some sort of recession. And when that happens, you could possibly potentially lose everything you put in this so-called market that's supposed to be there for you when you retire. And what's happened is people have said, okay, well, I got hit like you got hit, like everybody got hit. So people think, well, we all got hit, so I guess we all have to start over. That's not necessarily the case because there okay. are some families that are in position that don't even play the 401k game. Mm -hmm. And they create and continue creating intergenerational despite what happens in the market. And, you know, I really don't have a lot of confidence in the market that I can't control anyway. Right. You know, because they say, well, whatever Trump says, if he says something, then you could see the market being dictated. Well, I don't like that type of volatility right. with my future, especially right. when I know that there'll become a day when I'm too old to work or be employed. Right. So what am I going to do? How am I going to be able to to pay for things? And this is something I learned when I got fired. The first thing that came to my mind was no employer is obligated to pay you for the rest of your life. True. That is not a lifetime contract. The days of the 70s and 80s where our parents and grandparents had jobs for 25 years, those jobs are gone. Yeah. That relationship is gone. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter what type of level of tenure that you have. You could be like a master's, double master's, triple master's, whatever you have, mm -hmm. and you're making six figures, whatever. If they can find a leaner, younger labor force, which is what they're moving towards, yes. you out the window yes. or out the door. And so what are you going to do from that point? Because every 30 days, guess what? Your bills are due. 
Absolutely. I don't know any any bill creditors are going to say, okay, we'll give you a month. We'll give right. you two months. We'll give you right. six months. Without a, money. a huge penalty. <laughs> they want the, exactly. They want right. their money. So we need to be thinking uh, progressively about how can I get sustainable? And that's the one thing I've been teaching in my course on Crypto Woke is that it's really about learning how to manage your money. A lot of us apply for jobs. I want to have a 50000 or 60000 or $100,000 job but don't know what our financial endurance number is, and that's your expenses. You should be basing your currency on your expenses, and mm -hmm. expenses is something you can dictate. Mm -hmm. You might be spending more than you really need to be, which most of us are, mm -hmm. but if you really break it down to what my financial endurance number is, my basics, if you can cover that, then you're on a path of financial sustainability. Okay. And that's what I've been learning, that's what I've been using myself as that guinea pig to see that it works, and uh, that's why I'm here to share this information. Okay, so let's go to the beginning. Let's talk about money, what money is, and then what we think money is, especially in our community, since you said that we you know, have like a, a weird relationship with it. And then let's talk about the history of banking. So money, from what I was told in the beginning, is it's like that piece of paper that pretty much rules the world. Mm -hmm. But what I came to know is that money is really spiritual as well. So that fiat paper, that piece of paper really doesn't even have anything that's backing it. Mm -hmm. If anything, um, well, I forget which president, was it Nixon when they took the gold away from the, um, in 72, they took the, uh, the gold that was sort of balancing it and giving it value, they took that away and then it just became paper. But our society agrees that a $20 bill is worth $20. So you go to the store and you get something for $20 and the lady says, okay, that's worth $20 because we're agreeing. Mm -hmm. And uh, so then here you go. But it's really just paper, fiat paper. So what I've been learning is that, so we're going to talk about the nuts and bolts, but then we're going to talk about the spiritual because, you know, we, we woo woo on this show is that. It also has a spiritual component to it. And so when in our community in the past, everything has been taken from us. Mm -hmm. And so then we have a fear of not having. So it's a fear of lack, a fear of and that, that gets passed down generationally because you've seen your parents struggle. Mm -hmm. You may have seen your grandparents struggle. So then you have that. That's just how it is. Mm -hmm. And so then you make the same investments or not that your parents did. And then you're in the same boat. Mm -hmm. And what what worked in 24, you know, 1942 does not work in 20, 1980 and then 2019. So we're still using the same mindset with a whole new world. Mm -hmm. So the spiritual part of it is, is that if you fear it, what you fear expands. If you are afraid that you're not going to have it, then you're not going to have it. Because then the thing is, like your word is your wand and the, the, the part of the sort of energy that you put out is what you're going to get back. And so I'm learning because we're in the same boat of having left corporate America for whatever reason and having to figure out how to <laughs> how to. And, and I'm not trying to survive. I'm trying to thrive. Yeah. I'm not even trying. I'm thriving. Yeah. Like so that's my mindset. I'm not afraid of money. And in some spiritual systems, they teach that money is the root of all evil. That's bull crap. Mm -hmm. So stop believing that mm -hmm. it is a way to do the things that you want to do. Yeah. That's what money does. It allows you to do the things that you want to do. And I have so many things I want to do. Yeah. I, I think that, um, you know, there's, there's two points. I, I like to use the analogy of a, a, um, ant cut, a, leaf, a, a leaf cutter ant. Right. Mm -hmm. um, you've seen these in Costa Rica. Yeah, I did. So, I actually took a video. Yeah. So okay. you have a line of, it's just a long line of ants and all they're doing throughout the day from, I guess, what we know. We haven't watched them the entire day, but mm -hmm. they go and they gather food every day, all day. And then in the evening, I guess that's when they eat and they get up in the morning and they do the same thing. They repeat the same cycle every day. We in turn do the same type of thing. It's just yeah. that there's a there's one set separate piece. We get up in the morning every morning to go get paper. We go to get money. The money is what enables us to sustain ourselves. Right. We're afraid of money, I think, because 
we don't understand how to use it as a tool. Okay. We've been using it as a way to survive or as a means as, as you know, okay, this gets me through these two next two weeks. And then, okay, I got to get up in the morning and hustle again and be able to be here for another two weeks. We don't strategize and plan. Mm -hmm. And that's systemically done. It's not just catered towards, again, black people. It's, it continue, um, it's, it's basically propagated to the entire di diaspora community-wise. Yes. Because if not, the banks wouldn't survive. Right. The banks and the the government and the educational system are in cahoots about not teaching you about money mm -hmm. um if they did you would find it just like religion if you knew that you know god wasn't this lily white jesus then you would have no need for it you right. would have your own you would go back to your roots so right. what i've been learning is the way the system is set up is that the educational system is not equipped or they purposely do not equip you with the knowledge on how to deal with money and even in your, I was an economics major for two semesters in college, and I was like, this is too confusing. I was right. interested, so I got out. <laughs> right. But even in those uh, fields, you don't really learn about what money does. We are in a society that is, is about creating worker bees. Right. Okay. We are taught, you go to school, uh, you get this, to, you, you go to school, you get this education. When you finish college or high school, you go to a next level to get this degree, to get this paper, this certification, whatnot. But then what they don't tell you is how they don't show you how to pay for it, how to manage it. And they also don't tell you that as, as of late over the last 20 years, that when you come out with that degree, there's no job for you. Correct. So how are you going to pay this debt? Because, again, they're not. I don't care. You got you, we gave you this money up front. And student loan debt is the only debt you can't write off. Absolutely. And it's like in the trillions, I think. Well, it's one point five trillion dollars the, the the total American student loan debt is one point over one point five trillion dollars. Yeah. And the entire credit card debt is one trillion so it's it's 500 uh, million or billion more, more than credit card debt so that's telling you something that this educational system is not working that's because when we think back in the 80s and 90s mm -hmm. when these companies started subsidizing jobs and resourcing out what that did was move the opportunity for us to earn money here and we see it happening again now when we talk about artificial intelligence mm -hmm. we'll talk about that mm -hmm. because we see that artificial intelligence uh, is is showing that, and I had seen this clip the other day from Andrew Yang, not that I'm endorsing him because I don't deal with the votes, mm -hmm. but he talked about how AI or artificial intelligence is on the verge of wiping out the African-American $1.4 trillion purchasing power, our net worth would be down to zero, because these minimal jobs are being taken away through artificial intelligence. You so let's about talk about drivers. that. So yeah, think about the store, think yeah. about Target, think about the the parking lots, think about places where you've seen black and brown people who have those jobs and they are now automated. Yeah. So now they don't even have those jobs. So that's what artificial intelligence is doing. That's how it is impacting also them at that level. Mm -hmm. Now you might not want that job, right. but that job was still sustaining a family. Mm -hmm. So yeah. That, and that, that goes into our $1.4 trillion dollar purchasing power because mm -hmm. we're getting paid and we're constantly fueling the economy by giving our money to everybody else except ourselves. So there will be effect. There will be a definite magnetic effect that will hit not just our community, but the entire, uh, you know, the entire economy. But it's not, again, not to sound like Debbie Downer and talk about all these dark days that are coming. Mm -hmm. There are still families that are in position because they do the diligence. They understand tech. They understand financial literacy. They know about, the different things that you can do and how the money how the money system works and then just someone to get this little tidbit about the banking system um at the moment we still need it but it's on the verge of being you know obsolete Collapse. just like just like uh the internet did to you know the mailing company to po boxes they had to change their their entire model business yes. model to begin shipping like uh ups and whatnot because before just sending mail ain't gonna do it yep. uh so what we're realizing now is that this industry is shifting and the banking system is realizing that they're going to be affected because of fiat currency being on the down and, and, and cryptocurrency coming up. Uh, but this is what banks do to our money. Okay. I actually feel like to a degree, a very large degree, we're unknowingly financing our own gentrification. Um, mm. And it's been set up this way because when you think about it, you know, a bank cannot give out money to someone unless there's money in there. So that comes from us. Correct. We put the money in their vaults. They take the money. They're able to get a loan 10 times that value. And they send that out and loan it out to someone else and get interest off of that. The interest they get paid from that, we get nothing from it. But it's our money that we gave. That's the seed money. So this goes back, not just modern, it goes back to the history of banking. 
when in 1863, when we were emancipated and Abraham Lincoln was talking about the 40 acres and the mule deal, uh, well, he got assassinated. So Andrew Johnson, right. who took over, killed that bill. And instead they gave us one bank. They gave us Freedman's Bank. And Freedman's Bank was open for nine years. It was the only bank that was based in New York City that had moved to DC. Uh, but this was a national bank for all African-Americans that were now emancipated and working. And they would put their money in this bank. Over nine years, they assumed they, they tallied a total of about $75 million. The problem is, is that this very bank was managed not by African people, it was managed by white folk who would not give any loans to the very people that were putting their money in the bank. So just think about that. You're the one that makes the bank be what it is, but I can't take a loan out on that money. Right. So they were giving loans out to everyone else. Well, after a few bad deals, losing half of that $75 million, they basically closed up shop. Mm. And when they closed up shop, there was no money replenished back to the original bankers, to the account holders. So this thing goes back, not just, it isn't just modern with, you know, even Wells Fargo and their things of that nature. This is the nature of banking. They make their money off the money you put in. So if you stop putting money in the bank, then they don't make any money. So this is why direct deposit was created. Mm -hmm. Because if you think about it, when we first got paid, some people would either run straight to the bank, some mm -hmm. people would wait a week, whatever. Mm -hmm. So the banks are like, look, we need that money so we can loan it out. So direct deposit knows all of that. So now you don't even, check doesn't even come to you. It's, it's right put into bank. your account. So what are they doing? And then they're saying that makes it so easy for you. Yeah, but it's, it's easier for them. Right. Because every two weeks, they have this surplus of money that comes in on payday. And now they get, again, 10 times, up to 10 times that value of what is deposited. And they send it out to the companies and the, and the, the construction companies and everybody that's coming into our communities and brightening it up for them. That's our money financing that. So that's something that we don't know about. Mm -hmm. And if we were to now realize, OK, this is what a bank does. Uh, there are other things you can do to, you know, mitigate that. And I mean, it's kind of too late for like DC, Brooklyn, the whole nine generation, they have it, but there are other places that we can go. All we need to do is just find land and just move ourselves there together and we can rebuild another community. But this time with the insight and knowledge and awareness of how we can sustain it. Right. Yeah. So sustainability is, is what we're talking about. Yeah. So crypto, you, you mentioned a few things. I want you to go back and kind of flesh those out a little bit. Mm -hmm. Cryptocurrency. What is cryptocurrency? Okay. So I'll tell you what cryptocurrency is. It it isn't fiat currency. Fiat currency is the money that we, as you mentioned before, the twenty dollars. It's only twenty dollars because the government says it is. It's not backed by anything. Okay. Um, it used to be, but it isn't now. And so if I could convince the world, even Tony Brown did this years ago when he talked about coming out with, with his own money and then we probably laughed at him. Yeah. Um, now we have cryptocurrency. Not to say right. that he fathered that idea, but right, right. in the black community, he was one of the first to talk about it. But that dollar is only a dollar because the government says it is, right? But it right. also fluctuates in value. And they, because of the, the, the excessive printing of that money, um, they don't really make money off of the dollar, they make money off the inflation. Mm -hmm. So what cryptocurrency is, is one, well, one fiat is also centralized. So it's run by one entity, the government, right? Cent uh, cryptocurrency is a global currency. Um, and to have fiat currency, you have to be, you know, most people, you have to be connected to a bank or checking some sort of cash checking place to enable to use that or utilize or transfer that money. Mm -hmm. Cryptocurrency, you don't need a bank. It actually addresses the 1.5 trillion unbankers around a billion um, unbankers around the world, mm -hmm. and therefore allows you to, to to do commerce. And this is the beauty. Unbankers. Of yes. Un so those are people who don't have a bank account. Right. You have to understand, not everybody has a bank account. Yeah. Because they can't, they can't even get a bank account. Yep. So okay, yep. sorry. To There's a there actually this uh, what was the stat? I think the stat is sixty percent of African Americans in this country are unbanked. So is that is unbanked like sort of what our grand great grandparents were when they put the money in the in the in the in the, in the, in the, in the sofa under the mattress or whatever? Soccer. Yeah. I yeah. actually, my aunt and uncle, um, when they passed, I actually saw. Um, money frozen in their freezer. Wow. There were stacks of money in the freezer. Wow. And this was in the nine. this right. was in maybe 90s, the wow. late 90s when they passed. Mm -hmm. And I was like, yo, they got money in the freezer. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, and that's not to say, oh, start, don't put it in the bank, put it in your, in your <laughs> right. mattress or whatnot, because right. there's a fire is going. But also, it's not making any money for you. Yeah, that's the not. other thing, is that you want to make money, make money. So in order for you to live off your savings and investments, it needs to be in a vehicle that allows you to grow. So cryptocurrency gives you that opportunity because it's actually something like stock. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Where a stock in a volatile situation goes up and down the stock and the, the value of it. The other difference is, is that cryptocurrency is a 24-7, 365 operation. Okay. Uh, when you put something in stocks, it's Monday through Friday, 9 to 4. Right. 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 But you can see the values going throughout the day. If you look find a ticker, you can see the value of any kind of cryptocurrency. There's currently over 2,200 coins. Um, no, don't invest in all of them. And some people think, well, I got to get Bitcoin. If Bitcoin costs too much, I can't afford it. When you buy shares of a stock, you have to buy the full value. If I want to buy Nike stock, I got to pay $500. Mm -hmm. I might not have $500. Mm -hmm. But if you want to buy Bitcoin and you don't have to put around $12,000, you can buy $1.99 worth. Mm. And as the value goes up and down, so does that $1.99 worth that you have. And you can buy it anytime as often as you want. Um, I'm not saying put your life savings into it, but the frivolous purchases, the, the frivolous money that we have every month, going to the club and buying nails and buying Jordans and stuff Starbucks. like that. Yeah, you could, in lunch, you know, like yeah. if you really think about your financial endurance number, and this is what, again, I teach in my class to show you how you can find that extra funds so you think you don't have money. We have money. We have $1.4 trillion that we set, that we give to everybody else except, our, except ourselves. So we can find that number and then start putting that aside and say, okay, of this percentage, let me invest. Right. Let me put it in something that will enable me to create something down the road that is most likely recession proof, isn't caught into the systemic uh, ways of the 401ks and the stocks and bonds. And if you really look at those numbers, the percentage that you get from that, the yields are in the decimals. It's just like 0 0.1, whatever. Yeah. You get a CD, you get nothing. Yeah. I had a bond that was uh, nine years old. I put it, it was worth $100. It only accrued a value of a dollar sixty in nine years. Oh, so that's goodness. nothing I can really get. And I can't I can't retire off of that. You know what oh, I mean? So I goodness. cashed it out. I cashed it out, put it in cryptocurrency, and in three months it went to four figures. Oh. So this is the type of investments that are available. But is it is again, it isn't just cryptocurrency, but cryptocurrency does enable a form of wealth building that we've never seen before. And okay. we can't continue to be coming in, in the fourth quarter late with it. We, this is still the first of going in the second quarter opportunity. So I, it behooves everyone to look up what it is. Don't get caught up in the hype. Yeah. Don't pay nobody $1,000 to invest in something. It's, it's something you can easily do yourself. Okay. Or I would be more than happy to help you and show you how to do this thing. Okay. But you know, we need to be looking at how we can put away money so that we can do bigger things. And it's not about keeping it in the bank or keeping it in a wallet. Saving money is one thing. Having a goal with that money is the other. That's right. the thing that we lack is a tangible goal. Right. What do you want to do once you reach a certain amount? You just want to let it sit there in the bank? Well, no, because the bank is using that money to make money off your money. They give you right. no percentage. Right. So cash it out and turn it into something liquid. Right. Buy you know land, buy a home, whatever it is. Buy that business or whatever. Don't buy that Lamborghini. Buy something that has <laughs> value right. that you can now create and yield down or, or, or will down to your children's children's children and right. creating that intergenerational wealth. So you mentioned a class that people can look at. So you have a class and it's called Crypto Woke. Crypto Woke. Online master course. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about that. Yeah. And then I want to talk about blockchain. Mm -hmm. And then I want to talk about, you said buy land. Like yeah. some people don't, many people have just sold their parents, their great grandparents' houses. That's I know we had to sell our grandmother's house mm -hmm. our grandparents house and mm -hmm. it was very painful it just was what the situation called for at that time so you can teach us more okay so let's do this let's talk about this at the end how people can get in touch with you but let's talk about also what blockchain is okay. because i'm hearing a lot of blockchain so in my brain this is what i'm thinking so email so the internet is the internet mm -hmm. and email is a certain platform you can use on the internet mm -hmm. okay so i'm hearing that blockchain is like the internet and crypto is just one of the platforms you can use on the blockchain Absolutely. does that make sense Absolutely. okay mm -hmm. so what is the blockchain and is there a way that we can also participate in the expansion in the second quarter mm -hmm. of blockchain absolutely um Blockchain is, yeah, it is basically the foundation. I think that it was smart to first create the currency because that's the value. That's what's going to drive it. Okay. And basically blockchain is, it's a ledger. It's, a, it's basically a, a book of accounts and it keeps a tally of all transactions. Okay. Um, so when you think about a blockchain, for instance, in cryptocurrency, for instance, when someone purchase, purchases, well, even I'll use a fiat example. 
if you have a debit card or credit card, you go to make a payment, you swipe that card. What you don't see happen behind door closed doors is there's a third party mm. that so it's it's between your bank, the the merchant, and the, the third party is the credit card company. So the credit card company is the one who spearheads the conversation to reach your bank and say, okay, is this money in there? And the bank says, yes, it is. Okay. And then the bank said, then the credit card releases the funds to the merchant. That's um, when you see approved. Exactly. Right. And that's a, it happens, you know, there's, there's over 2 million transactions a second with Visa, MasterCard, mm -hmm. credit, mm -hmm. um, you know, all these other ones. Uh -huh. yeah. Imagine the amount of money that they're getting because the credit, MasterCard, they get a percentage. They get a very small percentage. It could be, you know, to, I don't know, half a percent, one percent, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. But when you multiply that by two million transactions a second, those families are paid. Yeah. They're making trillions of dollars because of these transactions. So what cryptocurrency does in regards to what blockchain is it's a similar situation. And I'll, I'll bring up the term mining because mining is what allows the transactions to be uh, validated. So as a miner, if you are a person that is that you're that credit card company. If someone swipes their card to buy something with cryptocurrency and you're part of a pool of miners, then you get a percentage of that transaction and you're able to then build wealth from that, not doing anything. Like I have, they call these things called rigs and these rigs mm -hmm. work. Uh, I'm not even at home doing it, but it's on and it's making money for me mm -hmm. because somebody's doing a transaction. And not, it's, not, it's not at 2 million transactions a second yet, but it's going to build to that because, again, it's a global currency. So uh, what we're finding with blockchain is that blockchain is basically a ledger that keeps an account. So it's a box of, say, for instance, let's just say 10, uh, 100 transactions and it's blocked. And then there's another chain that links to it. So if you want to go back and see a transaction that happened. I thought I was going to pay 200 grand. No, it's now it's 250. Well, how is that so? With cryptocurrency, you can't change that transaction. The number is what it is from beginning to end. And if someone goes and tries to change it, and they go to the origin of this, uh, this deal and they try to change it, add a zero or whatever on it, it's flagged. Mm -hmm. It breaks the chain. And then also you can pinpoint who did it. Oh. So this is the beauty of what blockchain offers. Blockchain also is going to be able to central decentralize everything so it's not in one area. What better way to hide something than to let everybody see it? So okay. when you think about your, they're going to be able to hold all your records when you're trying to get um, insurance. You know, all these people, you got to call these different avenues. You got to go through it'll be in one place that everyone has access to it so it's easy to pull up. The other difference is, is when you go to your bank, you can't ask them to see their books. They're not going right. to let you see their books right. because one, by law, they don't, they're not obliged to. And if you saw what they were doing with your money, you pull it out. Gotcha. But with decentralized uh, current cryptocurrency, it's full access. Everyone sees what's going on. If you want to, you can dig and find out where the information, where your money's going, what they're doing with it, the whole nine. They, they can see the lifeline of a Bitcoin or okay. any other coin. So there's value in uh, no hiding because everyone can see. Right. It. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. And one other thing with blockchain is that you know we're gonna see everything moving towards that from shipping. Yeah, to, I was gonna say yeah. I, I heard that like you know just it's like a way to move things. Yes, yeah. it, it's a movement of things in ways that we've never seen before. Yeah. And it's, it's easy shipping. access. It gives easy access when you go and get your uh, license plate uh, or your license rather, and then your license plate. All that stuff will be in a decentralized, but one lo not one location, but a location where everybody can get to. So if your computer goes down, the bank, the everything still works. But if you think about TransUnion, when their uh, servers were uh, infiltrated and they got everybody's information, when that thing shut down, everything shut down, right? They couldn't have access. But with cryptocurrency, we're not in crypto blockchain. blockchain. Uh, Everyone. So if my computer goes down, yours is still working and someone else is still working and everybody's linked that way. So it basically is 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 is, is um, hack hack proof, even though people are trying. But it's still basically a lot better situation where everybody has access to it and they can't really control one person, one entity can't control it. And America's trying to do what they can to discourage you into getting into cryptocurrency. Yeah. They're trying to tell you, oh, you need to file taxes and all this kind of stuff. Tell us what you're doing. 
Um, and they knew that they couldn't control cryptocurrency. So what are they doing? They're joining them. They're going to walk like Romans. They're going to create their own currency. Um, I've seen, you may have seen uh, Bitcoin ATMs, but now you're seeing Bitcoin ATMs in banks. Mm. If you see Bitcoin ATMs in Bank of America, uh, the reason why is because Bank of America realized, wait a minute, in a minute, you won't even come and put your money in here. So let's make money off of the transaction when you pull money out of ATM fees. Right. So they're understanding they have to change their business model because in a minute, no one's going to be using fiat currency, right. but they still want to be in the business of, of, of um, making money. And one last point, if you look at Fidelity, Fidelity and other uh, life insurance companies, they're offering you now to create cryptocurrency portfolios for you. They want to manage money for yeah, you. Yeah, I have seen an ad for yeah, that. Because they realize that, okay, let's let's take advantage of another level of ignorance because we don't know about banking. Right. So we certainly don't know about cryptocurrency. So right. let us manage your, 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 your retirement and we'll still get a cut from that. This is something that you can do for yourself. I've been doing it for myself for three years. Okay. And I know other people that have been doing it for much longer. And there are groups out there that are showing it and sharing the ways to do it because we're in a DIY era. Right. You can do it your damn self. Right. Yeah. You know? So that's interesting. I probably, we were talking maybe two years ago mm -hmm. and I went ahead and I bought some crypto. We have 20, mm -hmm. 20 minutes left. Okay. So um, I bought some cryptocurrency. I bought a few different coins mm -hmm. and then I just didn't, I just left them. Mm -hmm. So I have them. Mm -hmm. And I saw the volatility and whatever, but I didn't get into the hype because I felt like, let me just see what happens. Okay. So I have those. And so I need to figure out what it all means two years later mm -hmm. and, and what I can do to, um, you know, but I've been learning so much about money and so much unlearning. It's like an unlearning of a process yes. of, how to manage money and how not to yes and ways to make it work for me because i am to the point where i do not want to trade time for money absolutely and that's what you know you do you you go to work and you sit there for an amount of hours and then you get a certain amount of money for those hours mm -hmm. and if you're sick you don't get it mm -hmm. and and if you you know you get paid vacation but some people don't mm -hmm. And they don't make it. And so the mindset is you have to do all the time. It's always it's like a doing society. Mm -hmm. If you're not doing, then you're lazy and you're not going to get paid. But that's not like how it was supposed to be set up. Breed made it this way. So we really can be being human beings and not just consumers and um, still making money. But we have to do it in a smart way. Yeah educating yourself so that you can get off of the little rat race mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, enjoy your life. Because what happens is you're trained to go to college, you go to college, you're trained to get a job and you're trained to go into corporate America where you're working for somebody else and building somebody else's wealth. Facts. Right. And then you can retire at what, 72. Mm -hmm. And then you enjoy your life unless your 401k is smashed. Yeah. Yeah. So then what you got? No life. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and that's the thing that, you know, as you, you, you're touching on the spiritual component of it is, you know, if, if we didn't have to worry about money, we would be far more advanced as a civilization. Mm -hmm. And even though we still have to worry about money, I think that if you understand money, then you still can free yourself and do the thing that you really think you were put here to do, which right. is what I'm doing, which right. has made me realize, OK, I got books to write. I got places to see, things to learn, mm -hmm. elevate myself, get my chakras, my kundalini, all that stuff. I have the time to do that because yeah, I don't work for me when I have my I have my time. In the back of my mind, I am thinking, damn, I need to be making money today. <laughs> right. So I understand that, but put yourself in a position where you can do that and understand with the money. So that's the other thing that I talk about is it's it's one thing to make money, it's another thing to have the money make money. So yes, you can get paid from a situation, but if you're just giving it to pay off a bill, then you're just existing. Right. You know, so how do you put yourself in a situation where the money continues to come or the money that you have starts to grow? Right. And that's something that has been done for over 200 years. And I'm a plug class. Yeah. The wool class. Yeah. Because that's where I get into teaching you ways of or sharing with you ways that families for over 200 years have been making intergenerational wealth simply not by saying I got to get another job. They've been taking what they have and they've been switching the whole game. And the methodology of how you use money and using it as leverage. Okay. And when you do that, then you're in a position to then get into the next level where people are 
beyond sustainability. Now they're going on the path of wealth. So can you give us three tips? Because I think we have a few minutes, about 15 minutes left. What are three actionable items that people can do to educate themselves mm -hmm. about or maybe something they can look up? You know, we're going to talk about your class at the end mm -hmm. um, to get themselves started on this journey. Mm -hmm. Okay. Of being woke. Right. Of being, of being woke. And, and when <laughs> Financially I, woke. Right. And, and when I use, it's funny because when I use crypto woke, at first it was dealing with cryptocurrency, mm -hmm. but then I looked at the term and it, crypto is, is, is a short word for cryptic and cryptic yeah. is hidden. Yes. So there's hidden ways that, you know, they don't want the masses to know about. So mm -hmm. the biggest thing that I think you can start out with is history, man. Understanding the history of banking. Um, there's a book that's out that I can't, uh, what is it, the history of black money? And um, I'm trying to remember the exact title, but uh, if you come to my site or my page, I can send you the exact, um, the exact title. Okay. But it talks about the history of money because it is not only economic disparity, there is some racial stuff in there too. That's yes. part of, that's the crux of it all. But when you start understanding the history of money and how it came into it, and then two other books you could read is Our Black Year by Maggie Anderson. Uh, it talks about the disparity of black businesses and how it was designed in corporate America to then change. If you remember when we were in the 70s, we were 70 babies. The commercials back then were like, you know, uh, you know, very white, mm -hmm. very little black. Around mid 80s and definitely into the 90s, it became urban. Mm -hmm. Right. You had popcorn, chicken, KFC commercials. <laughs> and, you know, you had, you know, the running man for cereal commercials and mm -hmm. everything became hip hop mm -hmm. and whatnot. Mm -hmm. That was strategically done because the marketing industry realized that we are we have an unloyalty to ourselves in regards to putting money into our own businesses. Integration, I think, did a big number on us. Mm -hmm. It really made us think that, unfortunately, the white man's ice is colder than ours. Yeah. And so we dropped all of our independence of doing for ourselves and then realized, okay, well, now I'm accepted in court in, in America. So, okay, I can eat at their restaurants. I can buy their food. I can buy their goods. So in doing that, we let go of ours. And so in this book, Our Black Year, Maggie Anderson talks about how one entire year she went trying to find black uh, products mm -hmm. from gasoline to diapers to chewing gum mm -hmm. and couldn't find stuff. Killer Mike just did that. Bert. Yeah, he so, just did that. Exactly. Right. So that's the, that's the show that, as John Henry Clark said, Dr. Mm -hmm. Clark said, mm -hmm. master historian, African people could take care of themselves the world over just by doing for ourselves. So for every little thing that we think that we buy from shoelaces to toothpicks, we could have an African-owned company that does exactly that and cater it towards our people alone and we have a, a chance of creating wealth. Right. There's a couple other things that goes with that. Number one, self-identity reclamation trust. and trust. Right. Yes. Um, but that comes through self-identity reclamation. We need to know who we are, who we're dealing with. Right. Who we are, who our enemy is, so to right. speak. Right. Right. And when we understand that respect of it. Then we can say, okay, yeah, I should be investing in my, in ourselves and not creating ten companies, just do one or two. Right. That's the problem is that we always want well, my company's better than yours. Let's go. Let's do something collaborative. You know, cooperative. Right. So the other book I would say is uh, Collective Courage by Jessica Gordon Emhart. And she talks about the over 600 black Wall Streets that existed. Most people think, oh, it was just the one. And right. you know, th there's more than one black mm -hmm. Wall Street. And I say this because history enables you one to see that something was done before. So we're not, we don't have to make anything up. Right. It's we already been deal. done. Right. So if we get that history and that information, that knowledge, then we can take those tools, see where they, see, see where they air, and then also, uh, and make sure we don't do the same thing, but then rebuild from that same process. So if you're looking at books like this, we have to read. Number one, we don't yeah. want to read. I put in all of my posts, reading is still fundamental, mm -hmm. that we're afraid to pick up something and learn about our history. Because we don't read about our history, that's why we're in the situation we're in. So we, we can't complain. Mm -hmm. if you, if you're going to complain, then pick up a damn book right. you know, and read about your history and understand what the reality is because everyone else is doing it. Yeah. Everyone else has a plan and everyone yeah. else realizes the untapped source of resources Unlimited comes from the black community. Yeah, we just give it away. We just we just give it away. Freely. So <laughs> you got we got reading these books. Mm -hmm. What are two more? Uh two more I would say is uh <laughs> I would say definitely think about where you put your money. Mm -hmm. Uh well I'm gonna say and the last one would be take the damn class. Take my yeah. crypto class and I'll tell you everything. <laughs> Right. It's not to say I'm trying to make money off you, but there's so much stuff in there that yeah. I want to reveal. But knowing where you put your money 
and then having a goal, having a real life goal of sitting down and if not monthly, quarterly at least, what are your expenses? Yeah. How much does everything cost? Where's money going? So that you see that number. If you see that number, because we're doing it in our heads, okay? Yeah. Like this month, it's true. And we don't, do. and so we and we move away with it, and we think that that problem's going to go away because we we don't like dealing with money because of the heartache it brings, the, the 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 fear it brings, the anxiety it brings. But if you face that anxiety, you face that fear, and you see what's happening, then you can say, okay, well, this month I got thirty five hundred dollars in expenses. Okay, so what does that come down to a day? I need to make $166 a day. Oh, okay. That I broke it down. It makes it more palatable. Yes. So $166 a day comes down to roughly uh, $15 an hour. Okay. I need to find a job that gives me at least $1,500 in pay. Okay. I mean, $15 an hour in pay. Mm -hmm. So it's it's simplicity. When you break things down and put it into numbers, yes, it's an anal piece to it. But once you start doing it, you are actually mapping your place out of your situation. Because if you're not, you're going to continue on the same path. And all it takes is a crisis, an emergency, financial emergency, a death in the family, you lose your job yep. or downsize, mm -hmm. whatever, and your family's in jeopardy. Absolutely. So you know, it's coming. Winter is coming at the ant and the grasshopper fable. It's coming. So what are you doing to galvanize resources intellectually and in material form to be in a position where you won't get hit as hard? That just turned a whole light bulb off in, in my <laughs> head because it, you know, it can be overwhelming yeah. if you really sit and and let the fear overtake you of yeah. what you feel like you don't have. Yeah. So that's great. So crypto woke. That's your class. Mm -hmm. And how could people find out about your class? And um, what are some of the high level things you talk about? Okay. Um, in crypto woke, well, you can reach it at. Uh, any of the handles at crypto mm -hmm. um, IG and Facebook. Um, I will give you the website address, but it's much smaller. It's off my website, the Gattle Times. Okay. So if you go to the Gattle Times, D A G H E T T O T Y M Z dot com, you can also find uh, links to take you there. But I think it's easier if you do it through, you know, the Ghetto media. Times, the like the New York Times, the Ghetto Times. Yeah, 26, 26 years. 26 years. 26 years. Yeah, okay. I, I think it was one of the first African uh, centered websites out because it came out in 90, 95. Wow. But the, the publication's been in existence since 1993. So it's oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah, so crypto woke in the class, basically, I, I give an overview of the concept of what money is and banking systems and how we can actually internalize this information to become bank, bankers ourselves. And not okay. saying make it for someone else, but be your own source of money because really what it is is that, you know, you're putting money into someone else, else's institution and they're using that money to make money off of it. Well, you can actually put yourself in a position where the money you're putting towards yourself, you can loan from yourself and not be taxed. Mm. So that's mm -hmm. the goal is to set up a situation where you understand what money is, understand the value of how it works, and then set up something legally in a position where you can tap into it and use it to have a plan of a liquidized goal, meaning just don't have money in the bank sitting there like, yeah, I got six, seven figures or whatever in the, in the bank account. No. Right. What do you have tangible? Mm -hmm. How much property do you have or land do you have or, or this business that you're invested in? Be a philanthropist. I want to be a philanthropist. I want to yeah. invest in other people's ideas. Yeah, me too. How am I going to get that from a bank loan? No, create your own wealth. So this is what I cover in my course is to give you the freedom of understanding what money is. And it starts out with first not being rich, but getting sustainable, mm -hmm. covering those 30 day bills that you have. And then once you have that situation aligned up, pay off your debts, any debts you have from mortgages to student loans to cars or whatever you pay that off i'll show you how to do that mm -hmm. and then from there then you can start investing in large assets mm. and then our large assets will be here down to your children's children's children so how important is it to have you know intergenerational wealth like what has what have other um cultures been able to do with mm. that because maybe some people don't even know what that means right right so <laughs> When we think about endowments and we think mm -hmm. about uh, foundations, we think about like par mitzvahs, you know, like mm -hmm. kids that get, you know, grands of money for a 13th birthday, you know, where's that money coming from? Or when we hear of, you know, we might not know personally, but we know of some people that may have graduated from high school and they got a car or they graduated from college and they got a house, you know, these are the situations we are talking about creating a, a wealth stream that enables you to outlive yourself. Okay. We have to think about, and this is a principle I've learned that um, a quote that was said that if you're spending five hours 
you should spend at least five hours a week learning. And okay. if you're not, you're being irresponsible. Oh, wow. Okay. So it's really about putting in the time to understand how can this thing be bigger than I, because we collectively, when we were emancipated, we had 0.5% of the national glo uh, country wealth. We were worth 0.5% of that wealth, right? It is now 2019. We only have 1%. We only went up a, point, a half of a percent in wealth is what we've garnished in over 200 since emancipation. So the, the bottom line is that we have to understand that there's a reason why uh, we're in a situation we're in. It's because of ignorance. It is a cause of racism, but the ignorance is more prevalent because it's prevailing because we are choosing to use racism as an excuse, mm -hmm. as a crutch. Mm -hmm. Well, because I'm black, I ain't no jobs out there for me. Well, then create your own job. Right. Uh, you know, create your own situation, just like we were on the path of doing before integration. So if you understand that era and understand why we had to do for ourselves because no one else would do for ourselves, when we took on a little bit of that percentage, we'll be on the path of creating something for the kids that we don't even know are born yet. Right. And we just, they deserve that. They right. deserve to have that situation because the world is moving forward and it's been sucking on the tit of the black community long enough. Mm -hmm. And if we don't do anything about it, sorry to say, the tit might become dry. dry. up. <laughs> <laughs> and what are you going to do? Because now you can't even eat from it. You know right. I mean? So it really is about thinking enough to be honest with you. But the point is, is that we have to really understand that this is the way life is. It isn't a struggle. It's the struggle is about you wanting to apply yourself and, you know, change value for yourself. Mm -hmm. it's, it's there for us. OK. Yeah. So it's interesting. You're talking about generational wealth. So when my grandparents passed, I and I think when my last grandparent died, I was 15. Mm -hmm. So I remember standing at the bank with my mom mm -hmm. as she was looking at whatever was left because they left us some money. And I remember her saying, that's it. Hmm. I do remember her saying mm. that and I was 15. I didn't mm. know she was talking about, I was, and I saw the number and I was like, ooh, mm. <laughs> but that was 15, right? right? But I'm thinking about people who, my grandfather was a trucker. He worked so hard. Mm -hmm. He actually died in his truck, worked to death, had a heart attack, right? And then I think about in 2013, when um, I got a check for $75 mm -hmm. from an aunt who passed away that I didn't really know on my dad's side mm -hmm. and how it inspired me mm -hmm. because it wasn't mm -hmm. about the money. Right. It was about the fact that Should some, and then something. there were a lot of us, a mm -hmm. lot of um, nieces and nephews that mm -hmm. I don't really know. I only know a few of them, mm -hmm. but the fact that somebody that she thought to put my name down mm -hmm. and give me whatever was going to be at the end of the times. Mm -hmm. And I got that $75 check. And I remember being like, I have to, mm -hmm create wealth for my daughter mm -hmm. and then for her children. And now I have a whole bunch of nieces and nephews. Right. And I'm thinking like, I want to be the one and I want all of my siblings and all of my family to be the ones who leave that legacy yeah. and then have something to pass down because I, we definitely have the education as far as education of the world, mm -hmm. um, an industry, mm -hmm. but when you get the money, what do you do with it? Right. You know, so people are talking about, let's go on this trip and let's go on that trip. And then some people are saying, let's buy this land. Facts. So I think it's important. You do also and because you want to enjoy your life. Like there's nothing wrong with going on a trip, but there's also let's buy this land. If you invest, then you can go on many trips. Yeah. You know, it says we need to go to this trip and you will still pull back. I can't really get what I really want, but I'm mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. Or you could invest and say, you know what? We can go whenever we want. It's January or it's December or whatever. We're going. Mm -hmm. You know, we're going to our other home over in, in right. you know, in the islands or whatever. Right. We we need to be able to realize that we have the potential and we have permission from our ancestors to do that. They would. It's here for us, and that's right. why this is not coincidental. This this interview here isn't coincidental. The path that we've been trotting is the same path. Now, as I would say, bestowers of that information, we need to disseminate. Yeah. And for those that want to see the grow, you'll water it and we'll keep, we'll keep right. it. Right. Because you actually have the entire world at your hands. Right. You have the internet. Like you have the internet and you can look up everything. Now, everything that's on the internet is not true, right. but <laughs> you also have your intuition. Right. And then you have, you know, whoever you pray to to say, is, what, is this making sense or is that making sense or is this the right thing to do or is that the right thing right. to do? You don't always have to follow what everyone has always done. Mm -hmm. So in, in our two minutes that we have left, again, tell us um, about 
where people can find you. Okay. And then you have a new book yeah. that's coming out. So tell yeah. us, uh, or that's out. You have books. I have so books. Tell, let's talk about those yeah. in the two minutes that we okay. have. So I have, um, I've just, I just put out my fourth book. Uh, it's called Who is the Boule? Uh, it, it is basically the history of America's first black fraternity and the development towards the African self-reliance. What I found in my research is, is it isn't just about black fraternities and sororities, but it's about our historic black organizations, NAACP, Urban League, so on and so forth, who were put in place, we thought, to put us on the path of liberation or at mm-hmm. least some sort of, some sort of, of percentage of that, yeah, evolution. Um, come to find out that they've actually been in cahoots with the very people that have been keeping us in check. Another book I'm working on is called The Unknown Known, which is a, it's an extension of my first book, Analytical uh, Cogitations, which is basically talking about metaphysics and our purpose for being here. What are we really here for? Right. It's not just to make money. What am I really here for? Right. And the other book is going to be dealing with finances. And so these books are going to be out this fall. Okay. Uh, but it, it's really, that's what I'm saying. I, this is, it's given me the liberty to do the things that I feel like I'm really here to do. One of them is writing and, and speaking and sharing information. And when you put yourself on a path of financial sustainability, you can really find out what your purpose is. Okay, so go to theghettotimes.com yes. or you can go to at Crypto Woke yes. on all platforms. You can check me out at Awaken and Heal. And again, thank you so much for joining me in the sanctuary. Absolutely. We will see you next time. Thank you so much and peace. Bless.